Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. My name is Mark. Thank you guys so much for joining us today on today's program. Star Wars gets a new writer, Hellboy gets a new casting announcement, and I have been taught lies by Carl's Jr. Ashley, who's joining us? Also here is John Schnapp. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> also here is Ken Navsock. As we went to air, I saw an article here. This is NASA has a job opening for someone to defend the Earth from aliens. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> also here, Mark Riley. I will join you, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it looks like me and Schnepp today while uh, Bruce Willis and Ben Affleck over here go fight the asteroids. So hey, that's nice. that'll be fun for everybody. We, uh, we do them. have a lot of fun stuff to get to today. <laughs> exactly. Ashley, what is our first big story? THR reports that Jack Thorne, the British writer who wrote the upcoming Julia Roberts, Jacob Tremblay movie, Wonder, has been hired on to rewrite the script of Star Wars Episode Nine. The movie will be directed by Colin Trevorrow, who also had a hand in working on the most recent draft with his writing partner, Derek Connolly. Thorne is the creator and co-creator of several British television shows that include The Fades, The Cast Off, The Last Partners, and National Treasure. Star Wars Episode Nine is eyeing a production start in January of 2018, with the movie set for release on May 24th, 2019. Mark, thoughts on Jack Thorne rewriting Episode Nine? I'm uh, a little confused here, Ashley, because I don't know what to think of a rewrite. I don't know if this is a new trailer Treatment, if you're basing this off of the previous draft that Trevorrow had a hand in. And I'm really uncertain now as to what Ryan Johnson's involvement was. I mean, even when I got to interview Trevorrow, I asked him about Johnson and them having ideas for episode nine. And it seemed like they were working off some sort of treatment by Ryan Johnson. And maybe they had talks about it, but it was never specifically a script that was written by Ryan Johnson. He might have had some ideas that his movie, The Last Jedi, is going to bleed into episode nine. And obviously they want it to be as organic a baton handing off as you could have. And so, Ken, when you look at somebody new coming in to do a rewrite, does that strike you as some sort of a problem area that we need to go into a different mode here with episode nine? Or this is just them getting the script into the best shape possible? I would like to take it as them getting the script into the best shape possible. There's been a lot of, shall we say, mistakes or, or problems with some of the creation of these Star Wars movies. And I, what I will say is Lucasfilm, every time, seems to want to get it right. Mm -hmm. If that means Josh Trank and them part ways, that means they, they fire two directors. Whatever the behind-the-scenes reasons for this, we'll never truly know until a great book comes out. But I, I choose to believe, as a Star Wars fan, that I like this idea that they're like, you know what? We like this script. We like the ideas. We need to bring in someone who's not an action movie guy. He's not a big epic guy. He, he, he wrote the script based off the book for Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. He's done mm -hmm. a lot of theater. He's done a lot of that kind of stuff where it's character stuff, dialogue stuff, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with it, and I do wonder, Schnepp, if this makes some sort of sense in terms of the very sad and unfortunate passing of Carrie Fisher's character, General Leia. Now, if they have to rework some sort of script for Episode Nine, they had an idea of something they wanted to do, and now they obviously can't do that because they've decided with the Fisher estate to go a certain way with the handling of that character going forward that they do need to do a rewrite. They need to bring somebody else in to take this in a different direction, not necessarily because it's a creative desire, but more so it's just matter of fact, this is where we need to take this story now because we don't have Carrie Fisher around anymore. Right, well, I mean, let's address Ryan Johnson first. I think when he was first announced, he was like, he's going to write and direct Episode Eight, and then he's going to write at least the story for Episode Nine. Sure. Yep. So I'm sure he did all the story beats, and I'm sure he gave whoever the new director is going to be the story beats and the outline and, like, go for it. I'm not writing it, but here's, like, a 12-page outline. So uh, Trevaro and his, his screenwriting pal wrote a script, and maybe it didn't... Uh, yeah, and maybe it's not up to snuff, or maybe it just didn't follow, because a rewrite is different than a polish. A rewrite is like, hey, we're adding this person to like spruce up some dialogue. A rewrite is like a straight up rewrite. They're not saying a page one rewrite, but that's what it sounds like to me. When they say a rewrite, that means like we're taking all the other writing and throwing it away, and this other person is rewriting the script. I mean, there's no really other way to rephrase it. So, Mark Riley, now I get to ask you the hard question. You're a big Star Wars fan. 
I've heard of the movie. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so does this is this some sort of smoke leading to a fire here with Trevorrow's creative input or his ability to handle episode nine? Or do you think this is simply a matter of getting a fresh set of eyes on a property that they pretty much know all the story beats already? Well, yeah, you could look at this two ways. You could look at the Book of Henry fallout as a reason for this. They don't trust Trevorrow. They want to pull in another writer and kind of uh, rework some of the stuff, tighten it do whatever, or you could look at this as happening in Hollywood all the time, which I'm looking at. They hire another writer to come in and just punch it up, like you were saying, Schnepp. Mm -hmm. And you have, a, you have a writer coming in that is not known for action, he's not known for space fantasy, he's known for dramas, he's known for character. That is a good sign to me. So I'm happy that they're bringing in. If they said page one rewrite, then I'd be worried. But they're not, they're not saying that. They're saying rewrite. We don't know what that could be. Just like you said, Schnepp, could be a punch up, Put a little uh, uh, finesse on some characters. Address Carrie Fisher. Maybe there's a different way they were taking it. Um, but the interesting thing is, everybody keeps looking back at Ryan Johnson. He actually tweeted THR on this article. Said, small correction. I did not write the treatment for episode nine. So I don't know what that means. I think maybe he had the beats. He spoke with Trevorrow. I know Trevorrow asked him to do something for episode nine that would set up, or sorry, episode eight that would set up episode nine. And uh, I think he passed it off. And I think that Trevorrow and Derek Connolly did their thing, and now they have Jack Thorne coming in to do this. And speaking to your point that this is sort of normal in Hollywood, and Schnepp, you can attest to that more than anyone here, working in this business for a long time. New writers are brought in. Sometimes uh, Ben Grant and, uh, and uh, his writing partner always believe, uh, um, Thomas Lennon, that if you're fired, that's good. That means the movie might get made because they're bringing yeah. in someone else to complete the movie. <laughs> um, that's a good thing. We as Star Wars fans, and you can see I got my prequelist sticker on, uh, we're wow. used to one mad creator telling the stories he wants to do from start to finish, six movies, whether you like them or not, they were his visions, and I think as Star Wars fans, Mark, we hear this kind of stuff of, oh, they're taking this must be bad. It's probably just status quo, and they want to bring someone in to fine fine tune, rewrite versus polish. John's very right is different, but I, I, that's where I, I, I think I take it. Yeah, and, and I would not look at the book of Henry as some sort of indication as to Colin Trevorrow's ability to handle Episode Nine because it was a polarizing movie and doesn't have a great Rotten Tomatoes score. I don't think this is his Norbit. I don't think this is like, oh man, this is like so bad that it is going to turn the tide of this guy's entire career i will say that one of the things that he's brought up numerous times in many interviews including the one that i was lucky enough to sit down with him is he said that lucasfilm that entire place feels like a bunch of storytellers sitting around a campfire and all spinning yarns together as opposed to the scenario that ken napslock just brought up where it's george lucas telling rick mccallum and everybody else this is what we're going to do with the prequels come hell or high water you can either get on board with my vision or the door's right over there so now you have numerous people that are all spitting their best takes on what episode nine could be. And if that means bringing in new blood, fresh blood, then I'm all for it. Now, yes, a lot of this is me wanting to love these new movies that we get from Star Wars. I haven't seen a bad one from this new regime yet. And we knew that there was a lot of reshoots going on with Rogue One. And obviously Han Solo is a big mess right now that hopefully Ron Howard and company can fix. But I haven't seen a bad movie. And when it comes to the actual trilogy that we're making right now, I thought Force Awakens was great. We've heard nothing but great things from the set of The Last Jedi. And that movie comes out in December. So as of now, I still do have faith in Lucasfilm to get this right. And I don't think that a rewrite or a new writer coming in to look at episode nine when we haven't even seen episode eight is all that much reason to hit the panic button yet. So that's my two cents. And now I'm tired. What's our next story? <laughs> Marvel and Disney announced yesterday that Ant-Man and the Wasp has officially kicked off its production. To mark the occasion, Marvel released a small behind-the-scenes video teasing the new logo while also releasing an official synopsis. Peyton Reed returns to direct with Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly also returning alongside Michael Douglas, Michael Pena, and T.I. The synopsis reads... In the aftermath of Captain America's Civil War, Scott Lang Rudd grapples with the consequences of his choices as both a superhero and a father. As he struggles to rebalance his home life with his responsibilities as Ant-Man, he's conf confronted by Hope Van Dyne Lilly and Dr. Hank Pym Douglas with an urgent new mission. Scott must once again put on the suit and learn to fight alongside the Wasp as the team works together to uncover secrets from their past. Schnapp, what do you think about the video and synopsis for Ant-Man and the Wasp? 
Uh, it sounds cool. I mean, uh, we got to see a little a little concept art from Hall H while we were over at San Diego Comic Con. Uh, we got a little intro with Michelle Pfeiffer and Evangeline Lilly, kind of hanging out together, talking about you know the Catwoman outfit. Um, so it was, it was a really a, a lot of fun. It looks like it's going to be a really fun film. We're going to see Giant Man. We're going to see Ant Man. We're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of different outfits. We're also going to see the original Ant Man and the original Wasp. So. I think that secrets from the past kind of thing is like leading and telling you like perhaps we had conjectured the movie's going to open with an adventure of the original Ant-Man and the original Wasp, which we're all hoping for to see that. And maybe that'll clue us into what the rest of the story is going to be. Yeah, it was a cute little video that they released. It really gave us no insight into the movie whatsoever. But when you hear that synopsis, Mark Riley, this seems like such a great mix of action and comedy, which means that that July release date is perfect for Ant-Man and the Wasp. Whereas you had this year, you had an earlier release date for something like Logan, where that was a dark, more serious, a gritty action movie that had a lot of emotional undertones to it. I think you're going to get a lot of serious action and emotion from Black Panther, and that comes out in February, and then the next movie in the MCU, that's going to be Ant-Man and the Wasp. I think that's great for like a Spider-Man homecoming, lighter tone feel, and that could usher us into some hints as to what we're going to get with the Infinity War. Now, Infinity War is actually going to be coming out too, so what's your take on all of this, the release date, everything? Well, I, I'm a little, uh, I wanted to ask our resident comic book expert here, uh, or everybody here who's an expert in movies, this shouldn't it be after the events of Infinity War? That's my question as well, because Infinity War does come out before Ant-Man yeah, and the Wasp. So, and so. he's in it, so there's going to be huge things that happen there. Um, but I am interested in, in, you know, what does this mean for Scott Lang after Civil War? Because we know what side he chose. We know what happened. So where does that land in Ant-Man and the Wasp? But I'm more interested in what that character is going to happen with Infinity War but that's just going to be fun finding out. So for this, I'm just excited because the most excited I got was with Michelle Pfeiffer coming in and knowing that we're going to get some uh, story elements from that, where she went into the quantum zone. Right. Looks like she's coming back. Maybe not. Maybe we're getting flashbacks. I don't know. I just look at this cast. I look at this uh, synopsis. Uh, they mentioned the aftermath of Civil War, so that's going to play a part. I just like all the cast. I love that Goliath is coming in. Lawrence Fishburne is playing this part. I can't wait. Ken Knapsack, yes, sir. you <laughs> have signed up with NASA to yep. save the world. Yep. Do you think that Infinity War is going to have a huge impact on Ant-Man and the Wasp, or do you think that Ant-Man and the Wasp is going to be a nice little bridge between Infinity War and whatever the Avengers movie that comes next is? I think it's that little bridge, because what I think what they do well at Marvel is they have these big event films, and they get to go small, and they do it in such a way. I'd be worried following Infinity Wars. That's the spectacle. And now you got to go to a small, little uh, off-kilter, off-beat superhero, which I think they did so well with the first Ant-Man. I really do love it. Paul Rudd. Uh, I was a fan of Paul Rudd, but I was like, how's he going to do this? How's he going to fit into this? With his rudd like style and, and it worked out really well so i think the mcu one of the strengths is how it how it kind of narrow focuses back down from the big things and there'll be some kind of references to some of these events and you know i don't know riley maybe it's the temple of of doom of this where it's actually Ooh. before raiders and you just you, you just right. it's a yeah. timeline issue. I, I like that yeah. Let's do that. Shadab, how do we uh, rectify this? Because it, we, we do have Infinity War, and just from seeing that footage, it's this is like taking up multiple worlds and galaxies, and they're all uniting in this fight. Does this tell you that maybe all of our heroes aren't going to be as united and Thanos isn't going to pose the threat that we think he will in Infinity War, and they might save some of that end-of-the-universe kind of stuff for the fourth Avengers movie? Well, I mean, in comic books, there's certain things where they, they'll tell a story... And then a few years later, you'll see the events that happened before that story with those characters mm -hmm. and then the aftermath. So I feel like Ant-Man and the Wasp could be taking place right after Civil War for a good, you know, 80 minutes of the movie. And then like Iron Man, everybody shows up. You've got to come with us. They jump into some kind of weird like yeah. vortex, disappear, <laughs> cut back to <laughs> some whatever the heck happens in Infinity War. And then there's a little 10 minute like, you know, epilogue. I mean, it could happen that way. I would rather see it happen that way. I'd love to see the events after, right after Civil War, and that seems to be what the synopsis is saying. So I don't need it to follow Infinity War. In fact, 
you know, if it even mentions Infinity War, I don't need it to mention that. Ga Captain Marvel's being set in the 90s. Yeah, so, I, I'd be yeah. really interested for y'all's take on this. So comment right now in the live chat or on YouTube after the fact. Let us know, do you want to see Ant-Man and the Watch take place before the events of Infinity War? Is that timeline cool with you? I actually love that idea because that opens up the world to have all these other adventures with these characters that we know. So even if somebody like a Black Widow gets killed off in Infinity War, you could still have a standalone movie with Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow and have her be on some side adventure that, that took place five or ten years ago. I actually really like that concept. I'm also waiting for a whole series of what-if movies. I love those what-if comics. It was a crazy premise. It was one comic issue, and you're done. Wolverine, Deadpool, go on a road trip together. We want to see that movie. Mm. All right, let's move like on that. to buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley is going to give us a premise. We'll simply say whether we buy it or sell it, and then the internet will agree with us. <laughs> According to THR, Ian McShane has signed on to Hellboy Rise of the Blood Queen to play Professor Broom, a role previously played by John Hurt and Guillermo del Toro's Hellboy series. Broom is the leader of the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense and is a father figure to Hellboy after rescuing him back in 1944. Per THR, the new story sees Hellboy squaring off against a medieval sorceress who seeks to destroy humankind. The production is eyeing a September start and will shoot in the UK and Bulgaria. However, a release date has not been set. Riley Byers sell the casting of Ian McShane as Broom in the new Hellboy reboot. Big buy. Big, huge, huge buy. Uh, this is one of the greatest actors out working today. Uh, I love that he appeared on Game of Thrones. I love that he's in American Gods. I love all of his work wherever he pops up. And, and just by his casting, when you compare it to John Hurt, you can see they're really going in a different kind of, I hate saying gritty, edgier, but that it just they're doing an R-rated Hellboy, and this seems to illustrate that. And I love that he's going to be the adoptive father of David Harbour, who just stole it for me with uh, Stranger Things. I'm glad he's... Hellboy, I really want to see an R-rated Hellboy and see what they can do. Neil Marshall directing this thing. Now you got Ian McShane. Big buy. Schnepp, what are you uh, feeling about this? I'm, I'm getting sneakily excited for this new Hellboy. I really love the Del Toro vision of what we had with those two movies, right. and I was a little shocked that they were going to reboot this. I still don't know that there's going to be a huge audience for it. Smaller budget, different casting. I really like the moves they're making so far. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible to replace Guillermo Del Toro, so you have to go in a totally different direction. So if they were going to reboot it, I think they're rebooting it the right way by getting a really talented director, Neil Marshall. I recently rewatched Doomsday. If you've never seen it, check that out. Mm. But uh, yeah, Ian McShane can do no wrong. I mean, ever since uh, Deadwood, he's been one of my favorite actors of all time, and everything he's been in ever since Deadwood is incredible. He's just a great actor, so he just adds that caliber of awesomeness to Hellboy, which is I'm already excited about because of having Neil Marshall directing it. Ken, you are from Deadwood, California. What do you think of a hometown hero, Ian McShane, being in the new Hellboy movie? I'd love to say his catchphrase, but I, I don't <laughs> think I want to say it here on YouTube. It's a family yeah. show here. Here's how it goes. When you say this, Ken, buy or sell Ian McShane? Buy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> What's he in? Uh, it's a commercial for soap. Buy it. I'll buy the soap, too. Uh, yeah, it, what John said, man. Ian McShane in Deadwood. If you haven't seen Deadwood, do so. If I came late to the Deadwood party, and I'm a fan of Westerns. I just hadn't sat down to watch it. Uh, I watched it a couple years ago. It is it is a performance after performance just, just highlight for Ian McShane, who's just so great. There's also other great actors in it, of course. Um, but I just love this man. And, and you mentioned uh, his turn as a, in, in last season, season six of Game of Thrones. Brother Ray, Brother Ray. Uh, was a mm -hmm. one-episode one arc that just was just, he had you. He had yeah, you. Every, anytime he talks, you're, you're, look, you're looking and listening. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm not a Hellboy fan in, in that sense of the word, but he's in it. I, David Harbour is great, too. So, yeah, now, now you're getting people together that I'm like, I'm interested. Yeah, That's a buy. it's an easy buy for me too. I mean, Ian McShane, I, I can't imagine a, a, pr a production that they would cast Ian McShane and I would be like, well, I don't know if he's right for this. He's such a versatile, well-trained actor. He lends credibility to anything he's going to be in. And the fact that he's in the new Hellboy, again, only gets me more excited. And it might have started at Comic-Con or maybe even before Comic-Con, but David Harbour came on stage during the Stranger Things panel. And yeah. I think uh, uh, Patton Oswalt just made a quick joke about him playing Hellboy and he just got a big reaction from the crowd and it was like yeah this guy just he seems like he's got it then you add Ian Mick and as soon as you say Ian M something whether it's Ian McKellen Ian McShane we're going to like that casting 
All right, Mark. Yes. Right, I thought you had your hand up. You did not. <laughs> oh no, I'm just enjoying. It looks like, it looks like you had some sort of comment. No, like I'm this. enjoying. I was just. I was enthralled by that, and uh, I got lost in the yeah. uh, discussion. You know, there other people uh, would cut me off. Uh, yeah. You raise your hand, and that's very polite. I, no, Josh, this was just how I was si sitting. Just no, okay. this is just what. I, this is how I'm. I'm standing. That's. That, can you? Okay, can you clearly have something to say? No, no. I'm that's just, just stretching my rotator cuff. Yeah. Is this, this normal thing? Should I not do this anymore? Okay, Is that no, okay. confusing no, no, for I can everybody? Throw back to Ashley. Yeah, everybody has. in the back? Yeah. Uh, Sony Pictures Classics <laughs> has released the first trailer oh. for director Luca Guadagnino's <laughs> critically acclaimed new drama, Call mm, Me By hopefully. Your Name. The film takes place in 1983 and stars Timothy Chalamet as a precious 17-year-old American Italian boy who's on summer vacation with his family at their Italian villa. When a charming American scholar played by Army Hammer comes to work with the boy's father, a summer romance sparks that awakens deep feelings between the two. The movie debuted at the 2017 Sundance Film Festival to rave reviews and Oscar buzz and will open in theaters on November 24th. Ken, buy or sell the first trailer for Call Me By Your Name. Look, I didn't think a remake of Top Gun was going to work, but then I saw this trailer. <laughs> I'm all on board. They even got the volleyball scene in again. That's great. That's Kenny great. Loggins. No, I, buy it. I buy it because any time a trailer comes up and it has the little Leafs on a logo that means it's won some kind of festival and a music, like ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you're supposed to be like, oh, ew, well, I'm going to learn something from this. Um, and it looks good. Arby Hammer, who, uh, I, you know, I, I, sometimes he seems maligned. Sometimes maybe he's not in the best project for him. But I like the guy, and I think he. This is uh, interesting. The guy, forget his name. I'm trying to look. Uh, he is. Uh, he was in Boardwalk Empire. Uh, Michael. Michael Stolberg is that a Boardwalk Empire as uh, as uh, one of the gangsters there? He's great. And I. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll buy it absolutely. Uh, Michael Stolberg. Stolberg. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. He is. He is very good, and uh, I really like this trailer. I mean, this is something that clearly, because we're in the midst of a summer season where you get a lot of blockbusters and stuff like that, and now we're, we're, we're starting to make that transition into things that you could see a movie and have it emotionally move you to the point where it's going to be an award contender, and I think that Call Me By Your Name could be one of those flicks, Mark Riley, because like Ken said, it does have some of that prestige going into it where it's made the rounds at festivals and gotten a lot of critical acclaim already, and Army Hammer is a guy who, look, he's he's been in some projects that just have not worked out, and I think that we're all finally ready to forgive him for the Lone Ranger and mm. instead focus on performances that he has had, like when he came on the scene in The Social Network, or more recently when you see him in something like The Man from Uncle, and it's like, this guy does have mm -hmm. a nice versatile range to him, and I think that Call Me By Your Name could be the next evolutionary step for him as an actor, and also for the social progress of all the themes that you see in a trailer like this. Yeah, I it's, it's a buy for me, and you mentioned something with this you know, marketplace, just it's big budget. It's we're doing trailer reactions to these movies that are like, you know, adaptations of Stephen King, superhero, Star Wars, what have you. This was a nice palate cleanser. Not that I needed it. It's just something that this trailer sucked me in. It actually told a story in this trailer and I don't need to see anything else. I look at the Leafs, like you said, Ken, and I hear a lot of uh, my colleagues here at Collider who went to Sundance and saw this thing and went, you, the trailer doesn't even do this movie justice. This thing is going to be all the awards. So I can't wait for that. It's quiet. I love that. I love these movies that suck you in just by a trailer. And then to look at Army Hammer, he is so deserving of praise in everything he does. And even if he takes those chances with Lone Ranger, I get it. It, it didn't stick the landing. But he is such a great actor ever since The Social Network. I want to see him do... Uh, Get all the awards. If this is the movie that does it, more power to you, because then maybe he'll be like, what Green Lantern? Is that the the rumor that he's <laughs> uh, Nightwing, Batman, Nightwing, Green Lantern? Whatever. We don't know who he so is. this movie is gonna, you know, he's gonna get an Oscar nomination for this, and then DC's gonna come around. And we're going to get a, another great superhero movie with Army Hammer. That's sure. right. Army Hammer as Batgirl. Uh, so yeah. we all buy the trailer so far. John Schnepp, what was your take on this? We have 20-something employees here at Collider. A couple of them went to Sundance. It wasn't you or me. Wait, nobody knows how many Collider employees there are here. Unless Three. Unless previously worked here. New ones popping up yeah. all okay, the time. Right. Office um, space getting slim. Yep. Ken Knapsack. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Can I just say choo-choo? We're starting you know to what? use laps as seats. Um, Hey. So, <laughs> when I first heard 
you can call me by your name. I was like, is this some kind of creepy demon movie where yeah. there's like a weird, like, <laughs> I'm a doll, call me by your name. Or something. That's what I, I thought it was going to be like. I didn't hear about this Annabelle you know, knockoff. I, I literally saw like a weird demon because you're like, call me by your name. And then I click on it, and it's a Merchant Ivory movie. I was like, yo, <laughs> the return of my beautiful laundrette are these kinds of yeah. very nice and slow, real films. It's yeah. not trying to sell you anything. It's not a demon in a, in a bear outfit. It's, it's actually... <laughs> You know, some, something about real life. So, yeah, I buy it. I'll take all of your honey. <laughs> but can I, I'm, I'm going to buy the demon in a bear outfit. That just screams franchise. Demon bear three. <laughs> That's right. The, the term bear can be twisted around in modern society. He's talking about the actual bears, grizzlies, and whatnot that live in the woods. There's no demon bears in this story. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a buy for everybody. Here at the table, and now, don't worry, Schnepp, we will turn it over to a horror movie because you've been asking, and Mark Riley's had his hand up for the last five minutes wanting to talk about some sort of horror <laughs> flick. So, Ashley, let's give the boy, let's let him live out his okay, dream. Okay, okay. Lionsgate and Millennium Films released a new poster for Leatherface, the next installment in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. The new, the new movie takes place years before the events of the first movie in the early days of the infamous Sawyer family where the youngest child is sentenced to a mental hospital after a suspicious incident leaves the sheriff's daughter dead. Ten years later, he kidnaps a young nurse and escapes with three other inmates. Directed by acclaimed French filmmakers Julianne Maury and Alexander Bastillo, the film takes Stephen Dorff, Sam Strike, and Lily Taylor. Stars, not takes them, it stars them. Stephen mm -hmm. Dorff, Sam Strike, and Lily It'll Taylor. Take them too. <laughs> Leatherface yeah, will fine. be released on DirecTV on September 21st with a limited theatrical run on October 20th. Mark Byers saw the new poster for Leatherface. Actually, I do not care about this movie at all. I was not impressed with the trailer in the slightest. I buy the poster, man. I don't know what photographer used the Nashville Instagram filter, but it looks great <laughs> in the pale moonlight. It's scary. It's haunting. It clearly gives it nice connotations to what this movie is going to be. And maybe I used the wrong adjective there because, Riley, there's nothing nice about this flick. I know you're very excited about the movie. You like the trailer. So how does the poster hit you? Well, the poster's great. I'll buy it. I, I, I'm buying the marketing campaign for Leatherface, but... Uh, and, and I did like the trailer. I will see this because I'm a horror guy, and I and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original, is in my top five horror movies all time. However, don't, like, I, I've been saying it. Over, why are you telling me what's going on in Leatherface's mind? Why are we? Why are we going back? I don't need that. Like they did it. They again. I. It's the same thing. I'm getting on my soapbox when you try to go in the mind of Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees or Leatherface or Freddy Krueger. You are taking away the myth you are taking away the suspense the tension the why are you doing this which is so inherent in a horror movie and when, when you're trying to do it with leatherface i don't know so I, I like i said i'm gonna see it i'm buying the marketing campaign i'm buying the poster but man you better do something different than just pulling back the mask and going oh you know turns out leatherface just needed to talk to a therapist and we could avoid all of this you clearly are a Halloween fan because you oh, like the Halloween. shadow. You like the you just like this, if this you read, stalking character. Yeah. If you read the original script by John Carpenter, he calls Michael Myers the shape. He is never mentioned by yeah, name shape. other than by Dr. Loomis. He is the shape. He is a force of nature. And all you hear is escape mental patient right. on Halloween. That's enough, right? You don't need to know why he's killing people. Yeah. Uh, obviously, he's got trouble. But when you look at the same kind of uh, idea of storytelling, to Leatherface, it just takes away a lot of the, um, the like I said, the myth Ooh, of yeah. this character. John Schnapp, your thoughts on the Leatherface poster and everything Mark Riley just said. Well, I'll echo what Mark is saying. When when movies go into explainovision, vision they ruin <laughs> the mystery. <laughs> and that is, that's the, what you're talking about, yeah. the mystery of the why. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Freddy Krueger, we know that he murdered children. We never, we just saw like weird, creepy flashbacks on a furnace and him yeah. making the thing at the beginning. That's it. And then you see the, the aftermath of like, oh, you know, my family, all this kind of stuff in the original one. But, you know, when they over explain stuff, you said like an escape mental patient, you can add your own story and it makes it more frightening than it's like he grew up in this small town. It was like, you know, abused and then his animals were killed or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like and then it takes it away from like anything that you can bring to it. I think there already has been a Leatherface. Wasn't it called Leatherface the beginning? Yes. All yeah, right, part I mean, three. I, I, Texas yeah. Chainsaw Massacre yeah. three, the beginning. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know. Look, I love the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 
and I, I especially love the second one, which is crazy with Dennis yes. Hopper. It's a madhouse, man. That's like actually a comedy horror film. If you ask me, it's in the in the realm of Evil Dead 2. Yep. A lot of people don't take it that way, but I think if you ever watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, watch it as a comedy horror film. It's a fantastic film. I'll buy, I'll buy <laughs> that. I'll buy the poster. I mean, but we've been talking about when we're doing Nightmares, which will be returning someday. Woo. Um you know, we is. talked about Leatherface for the last three years. I mean, how when was this shot? In 2011? Yeah, that's I mean, a good point. It's been sitting on the shelf for so long that that's just not a good sign. So y then there's that, yeah. uh, the, the filmmaking aspect. I'm going to buy it. the poster. <laughs> yeah, again, we, we all really like the poster. <laughs> Nothing else about the movie necessarily, but we dig the poster. Where do you side? I mean, I, I sell the movie because it's scary, but look at that. <laughs> look at that picture. That right there, exclusive photo of Perry Nemiroff dragging me to a meeting. That's, <laughs> that's the only way I go to meetings around here is if someone drags me through a murky bog. Um, <laughs> Perry is really bulked up <laughs> in, the, in the winter. She's, yeah, she's been in the gym. Yeah. yeah, she's been doing some uh, CrossFit. And, uh, mm -hmm. She gets up like 4 a.m. to go to the gym. Yeah. yeah. Those bangs are getting a little unkempt, yeah. too. You can so, see yeah, that, that's exactly yeah. what's going on here. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll buy the poster because it looks it looks cool. I'm surprised, Mark, that Riley, that's not hanging in your office. No, it's which now has yeah, 17 it's be, people in it. Got to be a, a good movie for it to earn a place mm. on the wall. I'll tell good you good poster to sure. If but. this was like the poster, this is the first poster and the first like material that we saw for like the Strangers Part Two. I'd be like, holy crap! That right? looks any horror movie takes place in the woods. But Ashley, you put the Leatherface thing on the poster, and it dulls it for me a little bit. I'm still buying the poster overall. You guys, what is y'all's take? Because we only have one camera over there today. <laughs> what is y'all's take it's on the Leatherface camera. poster? Leatherface <laughs> camera, I like that. Um, when I first read the synopsis for this a while ago, I was so excited, like, yeah, Texas Chainsaw Massacre coming back. And then we saw the trailer, and I was like. Uh, no, I did not like the trailer whatsoever. And then you combine that with DirecTV and limited release. Like, this is getting worse and worse. But I must say, I really do like the poster. You do? I do like the uh -oh. poster. But besides that, I'm not feeling it anymore. <laughs> Uh, I mean, okay, so I, I don't like the trailer and I like the poster even less. They put that giant like leather face lettering title right on top. It makes it look like a book cover. Mm -hmm. And just yeah, looking at some that. guy being dragged off to the woods, that doesn't, to me, does not look like leather. It's called Leatherface. Where's his face? Why is he in the woods? Just like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Own your title. <laughs> There's so many questions from this poster. Now that Wendy brought up that it looks like a book, I no longer buy the poster. Yeah. I sell it yeah. as fast yeah. as I There's possibly that. can. Please check out our Amazon wish list and get us one more camera so we can be back up to par here and have everybody get their own shot. Uh, let's move on now. We want to remind you guys that at the end of this show, we're going to save some time for your live Twitter questions. So go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. And we we also have some cool news because we got more daily content for y'all right here on Collider Video, including that young man show, Heroes, ladies and gentlemen. John Schnepp is now hosting a daily show, Heroes, where you guys can get a 20, 25-minute morsel of your favorite Heroes news. We also have daily TV talk this week, which is live. So as soon as we're done here, Josh McCougan Company are going to come on in and give you guys the latest goings on in the world of television, Netflix, Hulu, Direct TV. Will they talk about Leatherface? Will we talk about Leatherface? I don't know who gets to talk about that anymore. Plus, comic book shopping, again, starring that young man over there, John Schnepp. And recently, you got to hang out with Rick and Morty cast members Chris Parnell and Sarah Chalk. Here's a quick clip. What's up, sweaties? I'm standing here with Chris Parnell and Sarah Chalk from Rick and Morty. What can they expect for season three? You can't visualize what it's going to look like if no clue. What were the comics that you used to read when you were kids? Man Thing. <laughs> the Man Thing burns. Do you have any um, Neil Gaiman? I absolutely love this comic. This is beautiful. You're picking that up. Yes. Thank you so much for all these recommendations. This is like the rabbit hole. I'm a big fan of Sarah Chalk and Chris Parnell. Chris Parnell, good North Carolina kid. So make sure you guys check out Comic Book Shopping and Awesome Tacular every Friday on Go90, or you can check out the link to the latest episode in this vid's description. And keep your eyes posted for the movie trivia showdown. We had an all-new Inner Geekdom match drop yesterday, the first of many Inner Geekdom matches you're going to be seeing coming up here very soon on Collider Video. Now it's time for Mailbag. This is the part of the show where you guys can email us anytime or send us a letter if you 
Well, I don't know if we actually get the scent letters. You should probably just email us, collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll either answer it on Movie Talk during the week or on our weekend show's mailbag. Ashley, what's the news like? Joshua writes, Hi, Collider crew, with THR speculating a Wonder Woman best picture chance. It got me thinking already this year, we have two amazing superhero movies, Logan and Wonder Woman. So I was thinking with the remaining films like Spider-Man, Thor, and Justice League, do you guys think this year could be the best year for superhero films so far? Thanks for taking my question. Maybe it's just my advanced age now, but anytime I see a question like this, I immediately scoff and I say, no, there's no way this is the best superhero movie year of all time. And then you look at the evidence so far. Wonder Woman was pretty great. Logan was pretty great. Spider-Man was pretty awesome. Thor Ragnarok looks incredible. Justice League looks incredible. We got a good opportunity here for a pretty kick-ass comic book run in 2017. So I'm going to set the bar here. And I'm going to give a pretty tough standard from the year 1994 as the mm. best comic book year of all time. Why? Because we got The Crow. We got The Mask. And we got the Roger Corman Fantastic Four. Mark Riley beat it. <laughs> wow. How can you beat that Roger Corman Fantastic Four? Just drop the mic and leave? But I will beat it. Uh, I, You know, this is... You look at these movies. Are they good? And do they advance the conversation? Do they change the conversation? And you look at years... The first one that popped out to me was uh, 2008. Because you had The Dark Knight, which is arguably the best comic book movie of all time. Arguably, yes. Arguably, Yes, but <laughs> a lot of people are putting it at number one. Mm -hmm. I would, too. That's just me. It's the godfather of comic book movies for me. But then that same year, you got Iron Man, and Iron Man launched the Marvel Cinematic Universe in a big way. That movie was amazing. So that's in 2008 as well. And then you had The Incredible Hulk, which also furthered the MCU, even though it was a universal release. And you had, what else was there uh, that, that stuck out for me? Nope, that was it. All right. Um, <laughs> I, but for me, this is the best year. It is. It is. For me, I look at Spider-Man Homecoming, which was a triumphant return mm -hmm. for Spider-Man. It's the Spidey I grew up with. It was also, it really had some ultimate Spider-Man flavor that Brian Michael Bendis did. I, I, I went right down that rabbit hole, read all those issues. So that was my Spidey. I love Spider-Man. He's second to my, uh, Kal-El Superman and they really did it right. Marvel got it right. And then Wonder Woman. Look at what it did. Wonder Woman, we're getting a sequel. That, that movie was fantastic. Thor Ragnarok is coming out. If that movie sticks the landing, which it looks like it's going to do, Taika Waititi is doing something very different. That's my most anticipated left in the year over Justice League. And then if you look at Justice League, I know there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of talk. What's going on? Joss Whedon is coming in. If he does what he did with Avengers and we get a great Justice League movie, this is hands down the best superhero movie year of all time. Uh, speaking of Avengers 2012, pretty good year for comic book movies yep. as well. Kent Napsok, what are you taking? I, I, this year, for, for me personally, might be one of the best ones. But I was going to say 2012. you got Dark Knight Rises, Avengers, uh, Amazing Spider-Man, and Anna Karenina. So you've got some <laughs> great comic book movies in there. Uh, and and yeah, there's some other good years. 14 is good, too. It's a pretty, pretty thick graphic novel there for know. Anna Karenina, but they got all that source material. That was like the Watchmen of comic book movies that year. John Schnepp, you have the final say unless I come up with another year better than 1994. Well, 94 also had The Shadow. You forgot about mentioning Damn that. Damn it! Wow. Damn it. Which is good. Shadow. 2012 Damn had it. Dread. Yep. Was, um, time, was Time Cop? Time Cop was 94, too. Uh, is that based on a comic? I want to say I, it's it a superhero. Should have been. been. He's a superhero, damn it. Yeah. It, I, I don't know. It could be. I can't. I cannot remember, honestly. Um, You know what? I'm going to say 2014 right now has 2016 beat because Thor and Just League have not come out yet. Now, if I go back and look at 2014, you have uh, Captain America, Winter Soldier, yeah. you have X-Men Days of Future Past, and you have Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, and then you have one. The Amazing Spider-Man 2, a giant hunk of garbage, which helped ruin that you know, amazing 2014, but it's still an amazing year. Uh, you've got this year, we've got Logan, we've got Wonder Woman, we've got uh, Amazing Spider-Man, well, Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, now we've got Thor Ragnarok and Justly. If both of those films are just incredible, then we've got five movies in one year that are great. Yeah. And that's pretty, I mean, you look at all these different years, and everyone has just, you know, it's, everyone has different opinions. Some people love this film, some people hate this film. You know, so every year has different people who are like, oh, I love Hellboy too, and other people, I hate Hellboy too, or whatever. So, I mean, could this year be the big year? Possibly. Next year, 
could be the even bigger year. Yeah, next I mean, year could be pretty nuts. I mean, you have Black Panther, you have Infinity War, Ant-Man and the Wasp, you're going to have Aquaman. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a lot of movies coming out. And, and we're going to get really good. This conversation is just starting because every year you're going to get so many comic book movies, hopefully of high quality, but none of them will ever be able to compete with 1989. Because we got Batman, Batman. The Punisher starring Dolph Lundgren, and yeah. The Return of Swamp Thing. Boo! Oof! <laughs> Mike exploded. Sure. <laughs> it imploded and went to the Infinity Wars universe. <laughs> well, until we can come up with a better comic book here, we are going to move on to some live Twitter questions right now. Hopefully, we have our one camera squarely on Wendy Lee because she is our beloved Twitter gatekeeper. What are they saying on Twitter today, Wendy? The first one comes oh, from... Oh, Sorry. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Here's Corner. I got you, girl. There it is. <laughs> Chris writes, with Noah Howley developing a Doctor Doom movie... What other TV creator do you want to see step into the superhero movie game? Oh, man, that's a good question. I mean, you always look at people who have had success with television and how that transfers into movies or even television series based on comic book material. We've seen greatness come from that. If you look at Arrested Development or Community, you can clearly see that storytellers that have a knack for comedy can make it to the big screen and have some of the biggest superhero movies of all time. So, Schnepp, is there anybody on your short list that you want to see as a television creator maybe transition into more superhero fare. Well, I mean, let me just say this. <clears throat> Noah, they, they haven't released a, an actual press release saying they're making a Doctor Doom movie. All this Doctor Doom stuff is coming from Noah saying, I've got two words at, a, at the end of one of, of Legion, saying two words, first word Doctor, second word Doom. Mm -hmm. And now everyone on the planet is running around saying there's a Doctor Doom movie that he's making. Why, is, why aren't people saying he's writing the new Fantastic Four? I mean, Fox has not released a thing. Yes, we're going to do a Doctor Doom movie. Now they've got Mads Mikkelsen weighing in. Well, I would play Doctor Doom. It's like, <laughs> it's not even official yet. Relax. I think it's the dumbest idea in the world to mm. make a Doctor Doom movie. I want to see a Fantastic Four film done right with Doctor Doom in it. But do I don't want to see a Doctor Doom Do you movie. think that that's the best leg that they could leap off of? Because Fantastic Four, the brand, it, from a cinematic perspective, has been tainted. So if you lead with Doctor Doom instead, and that might be flawed studio thinking that we got to get away from Fantastic Four and lead with the villain. Yeah, it's flawed studio thinking. It's stupid and wrong. And I think Noah is actually writing the Fantastic Four, and he just had a cool way of presenting it. He said, two words for you, Doctor and Doom. And everybody's, you know. <laughs> and if I'm wrong... So what? I'm just saying I think they should make it they should make a good <clears throat> Fantastic Four film. It's all there. You have hundreds of issues by Stanley and Jack Kirby to make the most incredible, dynamic, fun mm -hmm. action film. No one's made it yet. And uh, what's that on your shirt? Doctor Doom! <laughs> <laughs> so Ken, let's get back into the world of uh, TV here. Who do you think, uh, from a TV creation standpoint, could be doing some cool superhero stuff? It's someone that I, I think is very uh, on, on the radar screen, on, on the lower end, which is unfortunate. He is a comedy director, worked on Last Man on Earth, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I had the pleasure yep. of actually meeting him. His name's Payman Benz, uh, my mutual yeah, friends yeah. Uh, with Nick, Nick Mundy. Mm -hmm. And he, he, I, he's a sweaty. He gets it. And I think when you look at someone, again, you talk about Patty Jenkins Arrested Development, the Russo Brothers community, I look to something like that. Last Man on Earth is, is one of my favorite shows of all time. I love it. It's got, it's got uh, different, you know, it's got comedy, got a little action, it's got some emotional understrains, uh, and, uh, under, under, underscores, underscoring, understrains, whatever. And, um, <laughs> and, and he's one of the primary directors. Yeah. Undertones is what I was looking go. at. And uh, Payman Benz is one of uh, the mm. primary directors. I'd love to see someone like him uh, move to tell a bigger story. Uh, Mark Riley, give me mm. some good names for your short list uh can i call a slight audible and and move this to a kind of a superhero ish lead character hey, you had your hand up you can do whatever the hell you want uh <laughs> masters of the universe is a movie that uh i would love to see mm -hmm. and i think would benefit greatly by a uh, david benioff db weiss Ooh. uh move take your game of thrones flavor and go to masters of the universe and do it that way i would love to see mm -hmm. that because we're i mean let's look at it we're we're pretty taken care of right now with some awesome people doing some great awesome superhero movies in the next three years we know the kind of the lineup that's coming we got mm -hmm. peyton reed of course we got the russo brothers we got patty jenkins um who knows about suicide squad 2 yet but uh I, they, they just lost their their other director but 
we're pretty taken care of, so I'd like to take the superhero question, put it on He-Man, and see the Game of Thrones guys give us a hell of a Masters of the Universe movie. All right, well, a name I'll throw into the hat is Craig Brewer. He has directed some big-time pictures yeah. like Hustle and Flow and the Footloose remake and the Katy Perry movie, but he also does a lot of TV stuff. Still in the superhero world to some degree, so I'd like to see what Craig Brewer could do, maybe taking some of that into the big screen. Plus, the guy knows his barbecue. He's from the South, and mm. he's gone to Junior's Barbecue out here on La Cienega. Get a chance if you're in Southern California. It tastes like home. All right, Wendy, let's do another Twitter question. All right, I picked this one because it would be so much fun to speculate. This one comes from David, who writes, what horror movie would you take Josh McCuga to see in a theater? Oh, Ooh. that's great. I mean, look, the, <laughs> w w if, if you set the standard at It, which is going to be a really fun movie to take McCuga to, I think that Lights Out is something that oh. I really would take him to see because just the visual, the flare of the lights going <laughs> on and off and on, like, and the thing getting closer. Yeah. Yeah. I think Lights Out would be so much fun to watch him if you want to get a real visceral reaction because a lot of horror movies will creep up on you and that can get scary if done right. But just a great shock value jump scare slam bang Josh McCuga wetting his pants I'm gonna go with Lights Out. How about you, Ken? Is this all-time horror? I could choose all time. Any, any, any movie, movie. and, and yeah. pretend he hasn't seen it because he probably hasn't. Okay. Right. Uh, it would be my best friend's wedding. <laughs> 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 oh boy, what's gonna happen at the end of that movie? We don't know, but thrills Scary. and chills will ensue that evening. What do you got, Schnapp? Well, the film I'm working on currently, Demon Bear Three. I'll, he'll be the first person to screen that. But I, you know, I would I, I would go with Lights Out and then followed by Don't Breathe. Oh. And like, because Makuga yeah. said he's he's a lights on type of dude. Like he's like I <laughs> sleep with lights on. I'm like if I see something move, I freak out. He's like very jittery, kind of jumpy guy. Uh, you never think about it. He's like this giant big dude. Is like boo, ah, you know. It's like yeah. D don't breathe would really freak him out. Why? Because it's not about some nebulous weird ghost creature. It's a dude who's mm. like really creepy. Yeah. So that's a scary movie. Yeah. It's very tense. I'm going to his bachelor party at the end of the uh, month, and I think that maybe there's got to be... He's probably going to be too drunk to like notice right. like a good jump scare. We can, I can help you with that. I think I'm going too, so we'll, we'll plan <laughs> something. We'll plan a little screening. You know um, what? Schedule a meeting and have Perry make sure that Ken's there. Uh, I will do that. Let me get on Slack. Um, <laughs> if they're re-releasing -re The Exorcist, I'm taking Josh McCuga to The Exorcist. Yeah, yep. Because you have... Not only do you have, you know creepy possessed child but um there are some interesting flashes that happen in that when you see the demon kind of oh, come dude, up yeah that i want to put a camera on makuga and see that moment when he's like what is that like he would just <laughs> launch back scream he'd be hiding uh which uh, there's nothing better than watching that uh, reaction with Makuga. That is what I love about the the people and the personalities here at the Collider and Schmo's office is, is that we just like, like it, none of this stuff is staged. Like he, no. he is legit terrified of all of these movies. So we're going to have a lot of fun with Josh Makuga and horror movies to come. Uh, Wendy, let's do one more Twitter question and we'll call it a day. All right. This one comes from Jabawaki who writes, pick one to be on set of the entire Han Solo shoot or see an early cut of The Last Jedi. Oh, the early cut of The Last Jedi all day long, and not just because I'm not curious or don't want to deal with all the stuff going on in the Han Solo movie. I am a Star Wars trilogy guy first and foremost. I root for any Star Wars movie that comes out. A Han Solo movie is never the top of my bucket list that I need to see. The Last Jedi, on the other hand, is, although I am nervous about Luke Skywalker because he left on the highest note possible. That was Jordan in 98 at the end of Return of the Jedi, and so it can only go downhill from here. I'm apprehensive, I'm nervous, but I need to see that movie, Mark Riley. Uh, I'm going to go with Young Han Solo. I would like to start at the uh, beginning of production, watch all the craziness that happens, and then watch Ron Howard come in and do this amazing Twitter campaign where he's having fun mm. and see it right the ship because, uh, if anything, I am a filmmaker. I love to see the process. That would be fun because I want to say The Last Jedi for opening night audiences. I got to be in there with uh, all my people on that night. Yeah, that's probably a good call. Ken, uh, Knapsack. I'll go with Last Jedi because next to meetings, movie sets are my least favorite place to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking about boring. So I, I will, I'll watch a cut of The Last Jedi. Yeah, yeah. I bet the craft services on Han Solo are pretty good, though. John Schnapp, yeah. which direction are you leaning? I would actually go with The Last Jedi myself. Wow. I mean, uh, being wow. on set and not being a part of making something while you're on set is, I agree with Ken, boring. And boring. imagine being there while Lord Miller shooting all these crazy scenes. You're like, oh, can't wait to see that happen. Well, you're not gonna, because yeah. Howard's <laughs> sweeping it up on garbage bins, and it's like, 
<laughs> you know, seventy percent of that movie is never going to be seen by the public, and that's just how it is. So, but you would have seen it. You would have yeah. seen it get filmed. I'd write the book. Yeah, you'd be like, maybe yeah. The, the aftermath would be the book. So, yeah, but is. I would see Last Jedi. Yeah, I sympathize with you as a director being on a movie set, not doing anything. It's like being in the back of a comedy club and not going up. What the hell am I doing yeah, there? Yeah. Speaking of which, I'll be at the Comedy Zone in Charlotte this <laughs> nice. weekend, Thursday through Saturday. You guys can get tickets at MarkLSLive.com. John Schnepp, where can all the kids find you? Well, you can find me on Heroes later today and Comic Book Shopping with the Rick and Morty uh, cast. They're, they were great. And uh, you can find me at Carmel, Indiana this uh, Friday and Saturday. I'll be doing a filmmaking seminar. Come get sweaty with me. It's going to be hot in uh, Carmel, Indiana, baby. Ken Knapsack, when you are not being dragged to meetings or sharing your desk with three other new employees, what are you up to? Well, you can follow me at Ken Knapsack for all my adventures. I host Inside Schmodown live every Thursday, 2 p.m. It's released Friday on Collider Video's YouTube channel. NASA accepted my application. I'm going to go defend the Earth from aliens. <laughs> so you really just went to <laughs> fill out an application. You weren't actually going to the moon. We've been sold a false bill of goods. Mark Riley. Uh, at Riley Around on Twitter and Instagram. Stay tuned to Collider Video. I jump up on there with uh, Miss Perry Nemiroff for some breaking news, and I'll be popping up on Mailbag. You'll see me around. All righty, and we go over to our news desk. Ashley Mova, where can the kids find you? On Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. And we'll just stay on the shot for Wendy Lee. Uh, uh, uh. Wendy Lee Zaney, <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. All right. My name is merely Mark Ellis. You guys can catch us live on the Schmoes No Live Show tonight, 6 to 8 p.m. PST. And they'll be back for an all-new Collider Movie Talk hosted by somebody else tomorrow. Have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy Movie Talk Thursday and Friday. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.